hello, it's good to be with you virtually um, today. Uh, we are going to jump right into our scriptures today. And um, first we'll start out with a call to worship. We long for community in the presence of God, in whom we live and move and have our being. This day Christ tells us that we will never be alone. An advocate, spirit of truth, will share our journey with whom we live and create community and celebrate being. May love of God be with you and the joy of Christ surround you. May we know the presence of the advocate as we gather in this community of peace. May your truth lead us to the path of discipleship with deeds of bold mercy and courageous justice. As an Easter people following an, a risen Lord, may the life of Jesus live on in us and through us. Amen. First, we're reading from the Acts of the Apostles, or as we shorthand it, Acts um, 17, 22 to 31. Then Paul stood up before the council of Arapagus and delivered this address. Citizens of Athens, I note that in every respect, you are scrupulously religious. As I walked about looking at your shrines, I even discovered an altar inscribed to an un unknown God. Now, what you are worshiping in ignorance, I tend to make known to you. For God who made the world and all that is in it, the sovereign of heaven and earth, doesn't live in sanctuaries made by human hands and isn't served by humans as if in need of anything. No, God is the one who gives everyone life, breath, everything. And from one person, God created all of humankind to inhabit the entire earth and set the time for each nation to exist in the exact place where each nation should dwell. God did this so that human beings would seek, reach for, and perhaps find the one who is not really far from any of us, the one in whom we live and move and have our being. As one of your prophets has put it, excuse me, as one of your poets has put it, we too are God's children. If we were in fact children of God, then it's inexcusable to think that the divine nature is like an image of gold, silver or stone, an image formed by the art and thought of mortals. God, who overlooked such ignorance in the past, now commands all people everywhere to reform their lives. For a day has been set when the whole world will be judged with justice. And this judge, who is a human being, has already been appointed. God has given proof of all of this by raising this judge from the dead. That is from the uh, reading from the Inclusive Bible. We'll continue with uh, John chapter 15, 1 through 8. I am the vine and my Abba is the vine grower who cuts off every branch in me that doesn't bear fruit, but prunes the fruitful ones to increase their yield. You've been pruned already thanks to the word that I have spoken to you. Live on in me, this is Jesus speaking, as I do in you. Just as a branch cannot bear fruit of itself apart from the vine, neither can you bear fruit apart from me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who live in me and I in them will bear abundant fruit, for apart from me you can do nothing. Those who don't live in me are like withered, rejected branches to be picked up and thrown on the fire and burned. If you live on in me and my words live on in you, ask whatever you want and it will be done for you. My Abba will be glorified if you bear much fruit and thus prove to be my disciples. Again, from the Inclusive Bible I'm reading. Oh yeah, there's a whole lot in there to, um, to unpack and I don't think we have the attention spans to do it all this morning. So, um, you know, a few um, interesting points. I'll just kind of lift out some stuff and we can see what we think about that. And then in our 
uh, scripture discussion group, uh, please bring your questions and um, some of the things that I don't touch on because there's so much in here in these two things. But um, in John, we're looking at this. We've been in it a couple weeks now um, in what they call like the farewell text. It's Jesus is trying his best to make sure that he wants to make certain that we understand as much as possible who he is and who we are, who God is, and then who um, everyone is in relationship to each other. Um, and so a couple things I want to point out about John. It's kind of like uh, words of caution a little bit. Uh, John has um, fairly anti-Semitic, uh, not just tones, but outwardly, um, uh, you know, and it's important to realize that he was writing, not that this excuses this, but it helps to explain it a little bit. They were, um, the Christians and the early followers of Jesus were being, to, being um, they were being persecuted. They were being tortured and killed and um, by the, um, the religious, excuse me, the religious um, elite. Uh, and uh, so the, you know, not that, like I said, that doesn't excuse things, but it's important to keep that in mind. That so he's always kind of calling out and and um, seems to be um, and is critical of uh, of the Jews. And so that is not what Jesus is about. Jesus was also a Jew, um, and so we want to um, just kind of hold that as the frailty of our human condition that gets expressed even in the text. Um, that we look to. Um, another, real, but another a, kind of a cool thing I think about the book of John is that the synoptic gospels, you know, Matthew, Mark, um, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, um, all have a um, talk a lot about sacrifice and that love comes from. Um, you know, we benefit from love when we are sacrificial. And John has this interesting spin or, or, or vision that this love that we're talking about, Jesus, the Christ, um, comes from a place of fullness and uh, rather than sacrifice. And so often, um, so I don't know, it's kind of, it's, that to me is a gift um, uh, a gift that um, gives me another vision of, of, of not that sacrifice is not um, also a part of this journey, but that can come from a place of fullness, that um, God is in, or Jesus is inviting us into a relationship of fullness and does so in this vine and branches text that we just read. So Jesus is trying to make it... Um, you know, trying to make it clear, make it plain. He wants to make sure his disciples understand exactly why, um, who he is, who they are in relationship to him, and who he is in relationship to God, and all those varying different <laughs> um, vines and branches. Now, I know I have, uh, we have a couple gardeners out there, or plant enthusiasts, and um, it's interesting um, that uh, that this withered branch, um, and it's interesting that Jesus talks about how God prunes him, which is fascinating. Um, we'll talk about that hopefully in, in our, our scripture discussion time. But let's just focus on the plain stuff, the stuff that's just right there for us. You know, withered branch on a on a plant or a bush um, needs to be removed uh, because it's it it's trying to it's maybe diseased it's maybe without has not um, has not made the connection to the resources the water the sunshine the nutrients from the from the vine and the branch starts withering and eventually whatever caused that branch to wither if it stays on the vine, will eventually uh, affect the other branches around it. And so if you've ever been a plant enthusiast and you see, you know, a little bit of uh, a dead, a withered 
um, vine, you may try to give a little bit more water, or try to nurse it back to health, but most likely when it gets to that state, it just needs to be snipped off. Um, and the vine is, uh, you know, it's drained of life, so it can't pass along that life um, in a way that creates fruit. But a branch that bears fruit will produce healthy fruit because it is receiving and it's giving life to another. Um, fascinating, right? This fullness of love that comes from God to Christ and Christ in us and then through us to bear fruit, to, to um, pass that on uh, beyond just ourselves. And um, branches that are, now branches, it's interesting, branches, if you think of ourselves as just branches, it's not really, it doesn't seem very important or very sexy or interesting by themselves. But they're designed for the sole purpose of passing on and producing life. And the good news, here's the good news. I always, we always have to boil it down. What's the good news? The good news, as I'm seeing it this morning, is if we are withering in relationship to, to Christ, we have the opportunity to abide or remain, slow down enough, draw our resources from the and are for thriving from the vine from Christ. Being withered does not have to be the final word. In Christ, we live and move and find our being. We don't need to search anymore for life. We can find it in Christ. Isn't that incredible? Um, it's there for us. I'd like to read in closing a uh, poem. Um, this is Mary Oliver. Um, morning poem. Every morning the world is created under the orange. Sticks of the sun, the heaped ashes of the night, turn into leaves again and fasten themselves to the high branches and the ponds appear like black cloth on which are painted islands of summer lilies. If it is your nature to be happy, you will swim away, away along the soft trails for hours, your imagination of lighting everywhere. And if your spirit carries within it the thorn that is heavier than lead, if it's all you can do to keep on trudging, there's still somewhere deep within you, a beast shouting that the earth is exactly what it wanted. Each pond with its blazing lilies is a prayer heard and answered lavishly every morning. Whether or not you have ever dared to be happy, whether or not you have ever dared to pray. Have a wonderful day or evening, <laughs> um, and we'll see you again next week.